Chapter Nine of Evan David by Honoré de Balzac, translated by Alan Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Nine. To return to Lucien in Paris, on the morrow of the loss announced in his letter, he obtained a visa for his passport, bought a stout holly stick, and went to the Rue d'Enfer to take a place in the little market van which took him as far as Longjumeau for half a franc. He was going home to Angoulême. At the end of the first day's tramp he slept in a cowshed two leagues from Arpejon. He had come no farther than Orléans before he was very weary and almost ready to break down, but there he found a boatman willing to bring him as far as Tours for three francs, and food during the journey cost him but forty sous. Five days of walking brought him from Tours to Poitiers, and left him with but five francs in his pockets, but he summoned up all his remaining strength for the journey before him. He was overtaken by night in the open country, and had made up his mind to sleep out of doors, when a travelling carriage passed by, slowly climbing the hillside, and, all unknown to the postillion, the occupants, and the servant, he managed to slip in among the luggage, crouching in between two trunks lest he should be shaken off by the jolting of the carriage. And so he slept. He awoke with the sun shining into his eyes and the sound of voices in his ears. The carriage had come to a standstill. Looking about him, he knew that he was at Monsle, the little town where he had waited for Madame de Bargeton eighteen months before, when his heart was full of hope and love and joy. A group of postboys eyed him curiously and suspiciously, covered with dust as he was, wedged in among the luggage. Lucien jumped down, but before he could speak, two travellers stepped out of the caleche, and the words died away on his lips, for there stood the new prefect of the Charente, Sixte du Châtelet, and his wife, Louise de Negropolis. "'Chance gave us a travelling companion, if we had but known,' said the countess. "'Come in with us, monsieur.' Lucien gave the couple a distant bow and a half-fumbled, half-defiant glance. Then he turned away into a cross-country road in search of some farmhouse where he might make a breakfast on milk and bread and rest a while and think quietly over the future. He still had three francs left. On and on he walked with the hurrying pace of fever, noticing as he went, down by the riverside, that the country grew more and more picturesque. It was near midday when he came upon a sheet of water with willows growing about the margin, and stopped for a while to rest his eyes on the cool, thick-growing leaves, and something of the grace of the fields entered into his soul. In among the crests of the willows he caught a glimpse of a mill nearby on a branch stream, and of the thatched roof of the mill-house where the house leeks were growing. For all ornament, the quaint cottage was covered with jessamine and honeysuckle and climbing hops, and the garden about it was gay with phloxes and tall, juicy-leaved plants. Nets lay drying in the sun along a paved causeway, raised above the highest flood level, and secured by massive piles. Ducks were swimming in the clear mill-pond below the currents of water roaring over the wheel. As the poet came nearer, he heard the clack of the mill and saw the good-natured, homely woman of the house knitting on a garden bench and keeping an eye upon a little one who was chasing the hens about. Lucien came forward. "'My good woman,' he said, "'I am tired out. I have a fever on me, and I have only three francs. Will you undertake to give me brown bread and milk and let me sleep in the barn for a week?' I shall have time to write to my people, and they will either come to fetch me or send me money. I am quite willing, always supposing that my husband has no objection. Hey, little man! The miller came up, gave Lucien a look over, and took his pipe out of his mouth to remark, Three francs for a week's board? You might as well pay nothing at all. Perhaps I shall end as a miller's man, thought the poet, as his eyes wandered over the lovely country. Then the miller's wife made a bed ready for him, and Lucien lay down and slept so long that his hostess was frightened. 
courtois she said next day at noon just go in and see whether that young man is dead or alive he has been lying there these fourteen hours the miller was busy spreading out his fishing nets and lines it is my belief he said that the pretty fellow yonder is some starveling play actor without a brass farthing to bless himself with what makes you think that little man asked the mistress of the mill lord he is not a prince nor a lord nor a member of parliament nor a bishop why are his hands as white as if he did nothing then it is very strange that he does not feel hungry and wake up retorted the miller's wife she had just prepared breakfast for yesterday's chance guest a play actor is he she continued where will he be going it is too early yet for the fair at angouleme but neither the miller nor his wife suspected that actors princes and bishops apart there is a kind of being who is both prince and actor and invested besides with a magnificent order of priesthood that the poet seems to do nothing yet reigns over all humanity when he can paint humanity what can he be courtois asked of his wife suppose it should be dangerous to take him in queried she pooh thieves look more alive than that we should have been robbed by this time returned her spouse i am neither a prince nor a thief nor a bishop nor an actor lucien said wearily he must have overheard the colloquy through the window and now he suddenly appeared i am poor i am tired out i have come on foot from paris my name is lucien de rubempre and my father was monsieur chardon who used to have postel's business in l'humeau my sister married david sechard the printer in the place du Maurier at angouleme stop a bit said the miller that printer is the son of the old skinflint who farms his own land at marsac isn't he the very same said lucien he is a queer kind of father he is courtois continued he is worth two hundred thousand francs and more without counting his money-box and he has sold his son up they say when body and soul have been broken by a prolonged painful struggle there comes a crisis when a strong nature braces itself for greater effort but those who give way under the strain either die or sink into unconsciousness like death that hour of crisis had struck for lucien at the vague rumor of the catastrophe that had befallen david he seemed almost ready to succumb oh my sister he cried oh god what have i done base wretch that i am he dropped down on the wooden bench looking white and powerless as a dying man the miller's wife brought out a bowl of milk and made him drink but he begged the miller to help him back to his bed and asked to be forgiven for bringing a dying man into their house he thought his last hour had come with the shadow of death thoughts of religion crossed a brain so quick to conceive picturesque fancies he would see the cure he would confess and receive the last sacraments the moan uttered in the faint voice by a young man with such a comely face and figure went to madame courtois heart i say little man just take the horse and go to marsac and ask dr marron to come and see this young man he's in a very bad way it seems to me and you might bring the cure as well perhaps they may know more about that printer in the place de maurier than you do for postel married monsieur marron's daughter courtois departed the miller's wife tried to make lucien take food like all country-bred folk she was full of the idea that sick folk must be made to eat he took no notice of her but gave way to a violent storm of remorseful grief a kind of mental process of counter-irritation which relieved him the courtois mill lies a league away from marsac the town of the district and the half-way between Monsle and angouleme so it was not long before the good miller came back with the doctor and the cure both functionaries had heard rumors coupling lucien's name with the name of madame de bargeton 
and now when the whole department was talking of the lady's marriage to the new prefect and her return to angouleme as the comtesse du chatelet both cure and doctor were consumed with a violent curiosity to know why monsieur de bargeton's widow had not married the young poet with whom she had left angouleme and when they heard furthermore that lucien was at the mill they were eager to know whether the poet had come to the rescue of his brother-in-law curiosity and humanity alike prompted them to go at once to the dying man two hours after courtois set out lucien heard the rattle of old iron over the stony causeway the country doctor's ramshackle chaise came up to the door and out stepped messieur marron for the cure was the doctor's uncle lucien's bedside visitors were as intimate with david's father as country neighbors usually are in a small vine-growing township the doctor looked at the dying man felt his pulse and examined his tongue then he looked at the miller's wife and smiled reassuringly madame courtois said he if as i do not doubt you have a bottle of good wine somewhere in the cellar and a fat eel in your fish-pond put them before your patient it is only exhaustion there is nothing the matter with him our great man will be on his feet again directly ah monsieur said lucien it is not the body it is the mind that ails these good people have told me tidings that nearly killed me i have just heard the bad news of my sister madame sechard madame courtois says that your daughter is married to postel monsieur so you must know something of david sechard's affairs oh for heaven's sake monsieur tell me what you know why he must be in prison began the doctor his father would not help him in prison repeated lucien and why because some bills came from paris he had overlooked them no doubt for he does not pay much attention to his business they say said dr marron pray leave me with monsieur le cure said the poet with a visible change of countenance the doctor and the miller and his wife went out of the room and lucien was left alone with the old priest sir he said i feel that death is near and i deserve to die i am a very miserable wretch i can only cast myself into the arms of religion i sir i have brought all these troubles on my sister and brother for david sechard has been a brother to me i drew those bills that david could not meet i have ruined him in my terrible misery i forgot the crime a millionaire put an end to the proceedings and i quite believed that he had met the bills but nothing of the kind has been done it seems and lucien told the tale of his sorrows the story as he told it in his feverish excitement was worthy of the poet he besought the cure to go to angouleme and to ask for news of eve and his mother madame chardon and to let him know the truth and whether it was still possible to repair the evil i shall live till you come back sir he added as the hot tears fell if my mother and sister and david do not cast me off i shall not die lucien's remorse was terrible to see the tears the eloquence the young white face with the heart-broken despairing look the tales of sorrow upon sorrow till human strength could no more endure all these things aroused the cure's pity and interest in the provinces as in paris he said you must believe only half of all that you hear do not alarm yourself a piece of hearsay three leagues away from angouleme is sure to be far from the truth old sechard our neighbor left marsac some days ago very likely he is busy settling his son's difficulties i am going to angouleme i will come back and tell you whether you can return home your confessions and repentance will help to plead your cause the cure did not know that lucien had repented so many times during the last eighteen months that penitence however impassioned had come to be a kind of drama with him played to perfection played so far in all good faith but none the less a drama 
to the cure succeeded the doctor he saw that the patient was passing through a nervous crisis and the danger was beginning to subside the doctor nephew spoke as comfortably as the cure uncle and at length the patient was persuaded to take nourishment meanwhile the cure knowing the manners and customs of the countryside had gone to Monsle. the coach from ruffec to angouleme was due to pass about that time and he found a vacant place in it he would go to his grand-nephew postel in l'houmeau david's former rival and make inquiries of him from the assiduity with which the little druggist assisted his venerable relative to alight from the abominable cage which did duty as a coach between ruffec and angouleme it was apparent to the meanest understanding that monsieur and madame postel founded their hopes of future ease upon the old cure's will have you breakfasted will you take something we did not in the least expect you this is a pleasant surprise out came questions innumerable in a breath madame postel might have been born to be the wife of an apothecary in l'houmeau she was a common-looking woman about the same height as little postel himself such good looks as she possessed being entirely due to youth and health her florid auburn hair grew very low upon her forehead her demeanour and language were in keeping with homely features a round countenance the red cheeks of a country damsel and eyes that might almost be described as yellow everything about her said plainly enough that she had been married for expectations of money after a year of married life therefore she ruled the house and postel only too happy to have discovered the heiress meekly submitted to his wife madame leonie postel née marron was nursing her first child the darling of the old cure the doctor and postel a repulsive infant with a strong likeness to both parents well uncle said leonie what has brought you to angouleme since you will not take anything and no sooner come in than you talk of going but when the venerable ecclesiastic brought out the names of david sechard and eve little postel grew very red and leonie his wife felt it incumbent upon her to give him a jealous glance the glance that a wife never fails to give when she is perfectly sure of her husband and gives a look into the past by way of a caution for the future what have yonder folk done to you uncle that you should mix yourself up in their affairs inquired leonie with very perceptible tartness they are in trouble my girl said the cure and he told the postels about lucien at the courtois mill oh so that is the way he came back from paris is it exclaimed postel yet he had some brains poor fellow and he was ambitious too he went out to look for wool and comes home shorn but what does he want here his sister is frightfully poor for all these geniuses david and lucien alike know very little about business there was some talk of him at the tribunal and as judge i was obliged to sign the warrant of execution it was a painful duty i do not know whether the sister's circumstances are such that lucien can go to her but in any case the little room that he used to occupy here is at liberty and i shall be pleased to offer it to him that is right postel said the priest he bestowed a kiss on the infant slumbering in leonie's arms and adjusting his cocked hat prepared to walk out of the shop you will dine with us uncle of course said madame postel if once you meddle in these people's affairs it will be some time before you have done my husband will drive you back again in his little pony cart husband and wife stood watching their valued aged relative on his way into angouleme he carries himself well for his age all the same remarked the druggist by this time david had been in hiding for eleven days in a house only two doors away from the druggist's shop which the worthy ecclesiastic had just quitted to climb the steep path into angouleme with the news of lucien's present condition when the abbe marron debouched upon the place de mourier he found three men each one remarkable in his own way 
and all of them bearing with their whole weight upon the present and future of the hapless voluntary prisoner there stood old Seychard, the tall Quantet, and his confederate the puny limb of the law three men representing three phases of greed as widely different as the outward forms of the speakers the first had it in his mind to sell his own son the second to betray his client and the third while bargaining for both iniquities was inwardly resolved to pay for neither it was nearly five o'clock passers-by on their way home to dinner stopped a moment to look at the group what the devil can old Seychard and the tall Quantet have to say to each other asked the more curious there was something on foot concerning that miserable wretch that leaves his wife and child and mother-in-law to starve suggested some talk of sending a boy to paris to learn his trade said a provincial oracle monsieur le cure what brings you here eh exclaimed old Seychard, catching sight of the abbe as soon as he appeared i have come on account of your family answered the old man here is another of my son's notions exclaimed old Seychard. it would not cost you much to make everybody happy all round said the priest looking at the windows of the printing-house madame Seychard's beautiful face appeared at that moment between the curtains she was hushing her child's cries by tossing him in her arms and singing to him are you bringing news of my son asked old Seychard. or what is more to the purpose money no answered monsieur marron i am bringing the sister news of her brother of lucien cried petit claud yes he walked all the way from paris poor young man i found him at the courtois house he was worn out with misery and fatigue oh he is very much to be pitied petit claud took the tall Quantet by the arm saying aloud if we are going to dine with madame de senonches it is time to dress when they had come away a few paces he added for his companion's benefit catch the cub and you will soon have the dam we have david now i have found you a wife find me a partner said the tall Quantet with a treacherous smile lucien is an old schoolfellow of mine we used to be chums i shall be sure to hear something from him in a week's time have the bands put up and i will engage to put david in prison when he is on the jailer's register i shall have done my part ah exclaimed the tall Quantet under his breath we might have the patent taken out in our name that would be the thing a shiver ran through the meagre little attorney when he heard those words meanwhile eve beheld her father-in-law enter with the abbe marron who had let fall a word which unfolded the whole tragedy here is our cure madame Seychard, the old man said addressing his daughter-in-law and pretty tales about your brother he has to tell us no doubt oh cried poor eve cut to the heart what can have happened now the cry told so unmistakably of many sorrows of great dread on so many grounds that the abbe marron made haste to say reassure yourself madame he is living eve turned to the vine grower father she said perhaps you will be good enough to go to my mother she must hear all that this gentleman has to tell us of lucien the old man went in search of madame chardon and addressed her in this wise go and have it out with the abbe marron he is a good sort priest though he is dinner will be late no doubt i shall come back again in an hour and the old man went out insensible as he was to everything but the clink of money and the glitter of gold he left madame chardon without caring to notice the effect of the shock that he had given her madame chardon had changed so greatly during the last eighteen months that in that short time she no longer looked like the same woman the troubles hanging over both of her children her abortive hopes for lucien the unexpected deterioration in one whose powers and honesty she had for so long believed all these things had told heavily upon her madame chardon was not only noble by birth she was noble by nature 
she idolized her children consequently during the last six months she had suffered as never before since her widowhood lucien might have borne the name of lucien de rubempre by royal letters patent he might have founded the family anew revived the title and borne the arms he might have been made a great name he had thrown the chance away nay he had fallen into the mire for madame chardon the mother was a harder judge than eve the sister when she heard of the bills she looked upon lucien as lost a mother is often fain to shut her eyes but she always knows the child that she held at her breast the child that has been always with her in the house and so when eve and david discussed lucien's chances of success in paris and lucien's mother to all appearance shared eve's illusions in her inmost heart there was a tremor of fear lest david should be right for a mother's consciousness bore a witness to the truth of his words so well did she know eve's sensitive nature that she could not bring herself to speak of her fears she was obliged to choke them down and keep such silence as mothers alone can keep when they know how to love their children and eve on her side had watched her mother and saw the ravages of hidden grief with a feeling of dread her mother was not growing old she was failing from day to day mother and daughter lived a life of generous deception and neither was deceived the brutal old vine-grower's speech was the last drop that filled the cup of affliction to overflowing the words struck a chill to madame chardon's heart here is my mother monsieur said eve and the abbe looking up saw a white-haired woman with a face as thin and worn as the features of some aged nun and yet grown beautiful with the calm and sweet expression that devout submission gives to the faces of women who walk by the will of god as the saying is then the abbe understood the lives of the mother and daughter and had no more sympathy left for lucien he shuddered to think of all that the victims had endured mother said eve drying her eyes as she spoke poor lucien is not very far away he is at marsac and why is he not here asked madame chardon then the abbe told the whole story as lucien had told it to him the misery of the journey the troubles of the last days in paris he described the poet's agony of mind when he heard of the havoc wrought at home by his imprudence and his apprehension as to the reception awaiting him at angouleme he has doubts of us has it come to this said madame chardon the unhappy young man has come back to you on foot enduring the most terrible hardships by the way he is prepared to enter the humblest walks in life if so he may make reparation monsieur lucien's sister said in spite of the wrong he has done us i love my brother still as we love the dead body when the soul has left it and even so i love him more than many sisters love their brothers he has made us poor indeed but let him come to us he shall share the last crust of bread anything indeed that he has left us oh if he had never left us monsieur we should not have lost our heart's treasure and the woman who took him from us brought him back on her carriage exclaimed madame chardon he went away sitting by madame de bargeton's side in her caleche and he came back behind it can i do anything for you asked the good cure seeking an opportunity to take leave a wound in the purse is not fatal they say monsieur said madame chardon but the patient must be his own doctor if you have sufficient influence with my father-in-law to induce him to help his son you would save a whole family said eve he has no belief in you and he seemed to me to be very much exasperated against your husband answered the old cure he retained an impression from the ex-pressman's rambling talk 
that the Seychars' affairs were a kind of wasp's nest with which it was imprudent to meddle, and his mission being fulfilled, he went to dine with his nephew Postel. That worthy, like the rest of Angoulême, maintained that the father was in the right, and soon dissipated any little benevolence that the old gentleman was disposed to feel towards the son and his family. "'With those that squander money, something may be done,' concluded little Postel, "'but those that make experiments are the ruin of you.'" End of chapter 9